Hello, good people. This is Monday, July 13, and I hope you're all having a good summer. This is the Daily Word in the Crisis. You know, as we begin another week, I find myself, you know, once again swinging back and forth from a sense of hope and anticipation to the burden of a heavy heart. I have an overflowing hope for a remnant of passionate, faithful disciples in the body of Christ. But I grieve for the future of my nation, and by extension, the rest of the world. So, much of what I'm about to say is stuff that I wrote prophetically in uh, 2011, in a book called Visions of the Coming Days. It was published in 2012. I don't think a lot of people listened back then. God reminded me of it after a glorious morning at our church yesterday, Sunday, and as I considered what to put into my daily word in the crisis for today. In Amos, chapter 2, verses 4 through 12, God leveled six indictments against Israel. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to condense them. So here they are. Number one, rejection of God's law. Number two, belief in lies. Number three, economic self-focus. Number four, sexual immorality. Number five, arrogance. Number six, polluted and, and, and compromised devotion to God. I hope that all sounds familiar to you. God also handed down three penalties, or three reapings, for this collection of national sins. The first was military defeat. In other words, Israel wouldn't any longer have the Lord's favor to win the battle when the enemy came against them. Even though they might be well-equipped and strong, they wouldn't have the Lord's favor, the Lord's covering. Amos 2, 15 and 16 says, He who grasps the bow will not stand his ground. The swift of foot will not escape. Nor will he who rides the horse save his life. Even the bravest among the warriors will flee naked in that day. When the invading armies finally attacked Israel, Israel crumbled. So increasingly... I think, I believe, I know that we will see the military might of the United States stymied and limited. Looking back, although we, the United States, won every battle, we won every battle in Vietnam, we lost the war. That should have been a warning. But in our headlong rush into societal and moral deterioration, we didn't get the message. Scripture says in Zechariah 4 6, not by might nor by my power but by my spirit. And as we as a nation have rejected God's spirit, we as a nation have rejected God's spirit. And as a consequence, American influence in the wider world, I believe, will steadily decline and we'll find ourselves increasingly unable to significantly affect the course of world events in spite of our military might. And then there's Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. As a nation, America no longer fears the Lord. We've just lost the fear of the Lord. We've got a big, warm, fuzzy teddy bear in the sky, but not the God of judgment, not the God of war, not the God uh, whose fire consumes the wicked. So no longer do we stand on righteous ground. If we did, we wouldn't be seeing one Christian leader after another succumbing to moral failing. If we truly feared the Lord... We wouldn't be struggling with so much corruption, both in business and in government. Because we no longer fear the Lord as a nation, because we've passed that into law, America no longer stands surrounded by his protecting angel. The favor that we've enjoyed for so very long is being lifted. Our influence in the world, backed up by military might, will continue to diminish, and we're going to suffer for it. Number two penalty is economic collapse. Amos 3.15 says, I will also smite the winter house together with the summer house. Well, housing, even in ancient times, is a measure of economic prosperity. The unprecedented prosperity that's grown as a result of the Lord's favor upon us will be revoked. And now we face an economic crisis brought on by the threat of a virus that's taken us very quickly from historic economic expansion to levels of unemployment and business failures that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. Number three, closure of places of worship. Amos 3.14, I will also punish the altars of Bethel. 
The horns of the altar will be cut off and they will fall to the ground. God cannot permit churches to continue in which his laws, his standards, his morality, his word, and his nature are not honored and taught. Holiness befits his house, and he must defend it. In addition to that, when houses of worship prevent his Holy Spirit from moving freely, he will not permit them to continue. He is the sovereign Lord. And now what do we face? Well, as a result of the pandemic, churches all over the nation and the world, in the world as well, have been forcibly closed. We have yet to count how many will not survive the economic impact of those closures, or how many will find themselves severely reduced in numbers when it's all over. At the present time, it doesn't seem like there's any end in sight. As we once stood as a God-fearing nation under the protection of the Lord's angel, God has always raised up great men to lead us through every crisis we've ever faced. These were men capable of uniting and galvanizing the American people to stand as one and overcome. From the beginning, there were men like George Washington and then Abraham Lincoln. They weren't perfect, but they feared God. They made mistakes. They didn't see the full implications of the values they'd been handed, but they feared God. In World War II, it was Franklin Roosevelt. In more modern times, we've had Ronald Reagan, whose fatherly leadership drew the nation together, even as partisanship continued, and brought the Soviet Union to its knees and ultimate demise. For many years, I've warned that we no longer have such leaders waiting in the wings to lead us through the looming crisis. No one running for office in the coming election has the ability to unite the nation and lead us successfully through the crisis. Joe Biden certainly isn't one of those. I realize that many fellow conservative evangelical Christians think Donald Trump carries that kind of greatness. I believe he's done a number of great things. But too many consider him corrupt, justly or unjustly. And without significant changes, he doesn't carry the kind of greatness that unites a nation to face a crisis with unity. So this is the heaviness on my heart. But the hope remains. It's the hope that I've so often pointed out in Isaiah 60. I've got to go over it again. Isaiah 60, start at verse 1. Arise, shine. This is a, an exhortation to God's people. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. Hello? But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. You know what? We don't need great national leadership for us as believers to stand out in this culture and have a dramatic effect. What we need is to be faithful to our Lord. What we need is radical commitment to him and love for what he loves. What we need is to put aside lukewarm and weak faith. What we need is boldness. What we need is to pick up our spiritual gifts and use them to touch people and touch a nation. What we need is repentance for sin. What we need is prayer, not just for a new outpouring of God's Spirit, but for men and women like Joseph and Daniel to arise, who will have influence on kings and rulers. Both Joseph and Daniel heard from God and were able to, prevent, or to present solutions and advice prophetically to the ungodly kings who ruled them so that those kings and rulers had to admit that the Lord is God. So I'm crying out. I'm crying out, grieve with me, but take hold of the hope as well and rise to the calling God offers us in our day. We serve the Lion of Judah, and he roars, and it's time for us to roar with him. Stop being silent. Thank you, and have a great week, people.